All right, so good evening again, everyone. And um, on behalf of Apostle Teresa, we wanna thank you um, for joining us for our Tuesday night Bible study here at the Scrabble Conservatory. Um, and I will be your teacher for this evening. And I'm going to talk about um, a con not a continuation, but my understanding of what we talked about on Sunday. So um, Apostle Teresa taught on what is the prophetic for real. And that teaching, it completely blessed me because it demystified what the prophetic is. And one of the things that I said on Sunday is that a lot of times when we hear the word prophetic or even apostolic, it makes you think that this is something um, only for people in higher ranks, only for people in leadership. Um, and so that really, really blessed me to hear the teaching on Sunday because it showed me that it confirmed to me that, you know, we all have access to what we call the prophetic. So Apostle Teresa defined the prophetic as the tangible and intangible presence of God with us in all its releases without limitation. It is presence release through Holy Spirit. The prophetic is God's spirit, the spirit of righteousness and truth, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. It is the spirit of God, the comforter, the anointing, the breath of God, the wind of God, our counselor and the fire of God. The prophetic is not separate from Holy Spirit, but it is God with us. We see the prophetic in action from the very beginning. In Genesis 1 verse 2, when God formed the earth, when he created the heavens and the earth. And scripture tells us that the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. We learned that while there are many dimensions of the prophetic, the scribal dimension being one of many, there are two cornerstones. I only speak what I hear father speak. I only do what I hear the father says to do. The prophetic is not just an atmosphere or a place to perform. It isn't just about prophecy. The prophetic is not the gift, but the presence. It is not the tool, but the vessel. It is not the garment, but your heart. So this evening, I want to take you through several scriptures to show why we need the right understanding of the prophetic and why it is so crucial to have a new covenant understanding of the prophetic. One of the scriptures that Apostle mentioned on Sunday was in Numbers 11, where we see Moses complaining to God about the Israelites. He felt that the Lord was punishing him for making him responsible for such an ungrateful and what he considered to be evil people, right? He basically was telling God that he needed help. And we see God giving him instruction to gather the 70 elders. And God said he would take some of the spirit that was in Moses and he would put it in the 70 elders, right? So this is in Numbers 11. Verse 4 states, so Moses went out and spoke to the people the words of the Lord. And he gathered 70 men from among the elders of the people and stationed them around the, the tabernacle. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him, and he took some of the spirit who was upon Moses and put him upon the 70 elders. When the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied, praising God and declaring his will, but they did not do it again. Verse 26, but two men had remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other named Medad. The spirit rested upon them 
and they prophesied in the camp. So a young man ran and told Moses, hey, they're prophesying in the camp. Then Joshua, the son of Nun, the attendant of Moses from his youth said, my Lord Moses, stop them. But Moses said to him, are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. Then Moses went back into the camp, he and the elders of Israel. Now, a lot is happening in this scripture, but I want to point out two things. First, the spirit of God was on them, right? They prophesied, but they did not do it again. It was not an ongoing thing. It wasn't a habitation. It wasn't an indwelling. It happened one time and they did not do it again. The second thing that I want to call out is while Joshua was worried that there were other men besides Moses who were prophesying, Moses wished that everyone had that type of access. He wanted everyone to have access to the Holy Spirit. He wished that Holy Spirit was in all and everyone. By the time we get to Numbers 27, we see Moses is about to die and he is concerned about who will lead the Israelites after him. And God says in verse 14, in verse 18, take Joshua, son of Nun, who has the spirit in him and lay your hands on him. Present him to the priest before the whole community and publicly commission him to lead the people. Now, I'm going to go ahead and warn you. I have a lot of scriptures coming, but just trust me for a little bit. I'm going somewhere. I have a point, right? So we're reading and we're seeing that it's not a habitation of Holy Spirit, but we, are, we already knew that, but I wanted us to, to be able to see it for ourselves in the scripture, right? The next scripture that we're going to take a look at is Genesis 41. Now, this is the story of Joseph and Pharaoh. Um, but real quick, Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers. Um, Potiphar, who was an Egyptian officer, purchased him. Then we see Potiphar's wife tried to seduce Joseph. He declined on several different occasions, but on one specific occasion, he left his cloak behind. And that was enough for Potiphar's wife to then frame Joseph. And he, she accused him of taking advantage of her. He gets thrown in jail, right? But scripture tells us that in everything that Joseph did, he succeeded because God was with him. So Joseph gets thrown in jail. He starts interpreting dreams in jail for people who just so happen to be close to Pharaoh. Pharaoh then has a dream and he calls for all the wise men and all the magicians um, in the nation to come interpret his dreams. None of them were able to do that. Then one of Pharaoh's chiefs who remembered Joseph from prison was like, Hey, there was this person, there, there was this guy who um, interpreted my dream and he remembered that, remembered Joseph. So Joseph ends up getting called to interpret Pharaoh's dream and actually gave Pharaoh a plan to keep Egypt from being hungry during the famine, right? But then we get to verse 4, 38. This is Genesis 41, verse 38. Pharaoh asks them, Can we find anyone like this man, one in whom? is the spirit of God. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace and all my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. Pharaoh asks, can we find anyone like this man, one in whom is the spirit of God? If someone were to ask that today, our answer would be so different. We got Apostle on here. We got Minister Varuva on here. We got Apostle Pam. We got Prophet Andrea. Can we find anyone like this man, one in whom is the Spirit of God? How many people are on here right now? 15. We got about 15 people right here that we know has the Spirit of God in them. And because Pharaoh recognized the Spirit of God in Joseph, he gave Joseph authority. We should all be rulers of something somewhere with the spirit of God that we have on the inside of us. But we see this all throughout scripture, right? We see that the spirit of God rested 
on, on someone. It came upon someone. When um, we're talking about the story of the, the Israelites and, and their journey, every time the leader of the Israelites died, God had to raise up someone else and put his spirit on that person. We see this happening throughout the book of Judges, right? So we saw it happen um, with Moses, and then we saw it happen with Joshua. Then we get to the book of Judges, and um, in chapter 3, we see that um, God is raising up someone by the name of Othniel, the son of Caleb's younger brother. Scripture says, the spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he became Israel's judge. He went to war, and he, um, and God gave him victory. He ruled, there was peace for 40 years, and then he died. When you read further, we find out that the Israelites did evil again. Another nation took control of them, and the people cried out to God, like, we need a leader, because they were dependent on somebody else. They were dependent on someone other than themselves, right? So they're crying out to God, and then God raises up someone else. We get to Judges 6. We see God raising up Gideon. Judges 6, verse 34, the spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon with power. We see in Judges 13, we see when God raises up Samson, the spirit of the Lord began to stir Samson. Judges uh, 14, at that moment, the spirit of the Lord came power, powerfully upon Samson and he ripped the lion's jaws apart with his bare hands. So I'm, I'm bringing out these scriptures because I want to show you guys how Holy Spirit operated in the old covenant. He visited, he came upon, he rested, right? The next point that I wanna make is the prophets of old desperately wanted a habitation. Moses said in Exodus 33, God, if your presence does not go, don't, don't bring me out of here. I'm not going. The prophets of old desperately wanted a habitation. God comforted Jacob with the promise of Holy Spirit. Isaiah chapter 44, verse one to four. God is speaking to Jacob and he says, but now listen, Jacob, my servant, whom I have chosen. This is what the Lord says. He who made you, who formed you in the womb and who will help you, do not be afraid for I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. They will spring up like grass in a meadow like poplar trees by flowing streams. Isaiah 32, verse 15. Until at last the spirit is poured out on us from heaven. Until at last, like finally, like the, the prophets of old were waiting on the promise of Holy Spirit. David prayed all throughout the book of Psalms for a habitation of God's presence. Psalm 143, verse 10. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your gracious spirit lead me forward on a firm footing. Psalm 51, we all know this psalm where, where David is crying out to God. Do not banish me from your presence. Don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. Ezekiel chapter 36. And I will put my spirit in you so that you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey my regulations. Holy Spirit is our help. Isaiah 64 verse one. Oh, that you would burst down from the heavens and come down. How the mountains would quake in your presence. They desperately wanted a habitation of Holy Spirit. Isaiah 61. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. We know this by heart. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives to, and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion. 
to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Ezekiel chap in chapter two, his call and commission, son of man, stand up on your feet and I will speak to you. As he spoke, the spirit came into him and raised him to his feet. David said in, in 2 Samuel 23, verse 2, the spirit of the Lord speaks through me. His words are upon my tongue. Now, this next scripture, 1 Samuel 10, the spirit of the Lord came upon Saul, right? When Saul and his servant arrived, a procession of prophets met him. The spirit of God came powerfully upon him and he joined in their prophesying. This was 1 Samuel 10. By the time we get to 1 Samuel 16, the spirit of the Lord left Saul. It was not a habitation. Holy Spirit is our promise. In Job 26, Job is writing a letter to his friend named Bildad. But in this letter, he is talking about God's power. And this scripture really blessed me. I had never read it before. And he's talking about how, you know, great God is. In verse seven, this is Job chapter 26. Um, he says, he's talking about God. He says, he spreads out the northern skies over empty space. He suspends the earth over nothing. He wraps up the waters in his clouds, yet the clouds do not burst under their weight. He covers the face of the full moon spreading his clouds over it. He marks out the horizon on the face of the waters for a boundary between light and darkness. He's talking about God and all that God has done. Verse 11, the pillars of the heavens quake at his rebuke. By his power, he churned up the sea. By his wisdom, he cut Rahab to pieces. By his breath, the skies became fair. His hand pierced the gliding serpent. But listen to this. In verse 14, he says, and these are but the outer fringe of his works. He, he just said, God wraps up the waters in his clouds. He separates the sky. Like he's talking about the grandeur of God, like how God is amazing and how he does. He did all these things. He and then he goes on to say, and these are but the outer fringe of his works. How faint the whisper we hear of him. Who then can understand the thunder of his power? There's another version that says, um, I believe it's the New Living Translation that says, these are just the beginning of all that he does. Merely a whisper of his power. God was just getting started. He was just getting started. This scripture blessed me so much because you're hearing about all that God has done. When you look outside and you see the trees, the ocean, you just marvel at nature, at what God has done, but he's just getting started. He is just getting started. Holy Spirit is our promise. Holy Spirit is our promise. That's the point that we're on, right? Joel chapter two, verse 28 to 29. Another one that we all know. And afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even my servants, both men and women, even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Holy Spirit is our promise. John 14, verse 16. And God will give you a helper and the father will give you a helper that he may abide with you forever. What a dream for the prophets of old to know that at some point, the spirit of the Lord that came upon and left, came upon and left, that at some point we would have access to that help that he may abide with you forever. Acts 1. So this is after Jesus died. 
he was resurrected and he reappeared to the disciples, right? Acts 1. And he was telling them of the promise of Holy Spirit. Um, he told them, you know, Holy Spirit was coming. And afterwards, he was taken up into a cloud. Acts 1 verse 11 states that two white robed men, presumably angels, they asked um, the disciples after you know, Christ was taken up into a cloud. He said, well, why? They said, why are you staring into heaven? But someday he will return from heaven in the same way that you saw him go. And we've been talking about, you know, the cloud is in us. The cloud is, the cloud is in us. Christ left in a cloud and, and he came back the same way that we saw him go. He came back in a cloud, the cloud that's in us. I, I was like, oh, what? <laughs> I was really blessed by, by that too. I like disclaimer. I so enjoyed like researching and, you know, reading scriptures for this Bible study tonight because it, I was just very amazed at how, like, how did I not see this before? Next scripture, Matthew 13, verse 16 to 17. Jesus said to his disciples once, blessed are your eyes because they see and your ear because they hear for truly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desire to see what you see and did not see it and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. We just went through those scriptures. They desperately wanted a habitation and Christ acknowledged that. He said, many prophets, many righteous men, they wanted to see what you see, what we have access to. Many prophets and righteous men wanted that access. They wanted to see what we have the ability to see. They wanted to hear what we have the ability to hear. And as we learned on Sunday, those are the two cornerstones of the prophetic. Next scripture, <laughs> second Corinthians, I'm almost done. <laughs> second Corinthians Chapter three, verse six to 11. He made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. Not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit which was engraved in letters on stone came with glory so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory. Transitory though it was, will not the ministry of the spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was transitory came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? So with that scripture, I want to say, we are ministers of a new covenant. We are stewards of the prophetic. The prophetic is God's covenant. It is his grace for us. It is his love for us. The prophetic is communion with God. I want to leave you with a couple more points. I'm almost done. <laughs> the first thing, if you, if you didn't hear anything else, I want you to hear this. We need to know that we have access to the prophetic. We have access. We have access. And as I was, you know, preparing, I was thinking about, you know, like some of the, the things that Apostle has said about like having people pray for you. And, you know, this is why like some prayers are problematic because like a lot of times we're praying for things that we already have. We already have, Lord, open up the floodgates of heaven. It's already open. Next. Lord, I want to be close to you. He's in you. So there goes that. <laughs> There's no distance. There's no distance. We can't pray like how David prayed. 
We can't say, cast me not. Why? Because he said he'll never leave us nor forsake us. Why are we asking, why are we saying, cast me not away from your presence? He's in us. And this is exactly why Christ is the prototype. This is why Christ is the example. He is the template. This is why we elevate Christ above men. This is also why prophecy is not the mark of a prophet. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 5, this is also how we can pray without ceasing. Why? Because the prophetic is habitation. Jesus said, my father's house has many mansions, many rooms, many dwelling places. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? It's us. We are the temple of Holy Spirit. What an honor to house Holy Spirit. In that scripture, I, I know Christ. He could have been talking about a heavenly home, but he's talking about us. He is talking about us. If we ever needed a tent revival, we need one in here first. We need one in here first. All right. This is my last scripture. Second Peter 1 verse 3. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. We have everything we need for life and godliness. In the presence of God, there is fullness of joy. There is peace. There is hope. There is love. Those things should reside in us as well because we carry presence. And that's all that I have for tonight. I pray that this blessed you as much as it blessed me to prepare. So that's it. <laughs>